Good morning. Um, so uh, today we're moving on with Dretschke's spin on the causal theory of representation. And um, th there's a really big gap in the way we've discussed the causal theory so far. We've looked at uh, how different types of causal chain might be important for reference, but we haven't really got to why those causal chains should be setting standards of right and wrong for our representations. And that's where Dretschke's account comes in. But before we go on to the Dretschke, I want to add a couple of uh, footnotes to the stuff we were discussing last time. Um, one reason is that five minutes um, after the lecture last time, I suddenly thought of a much better way of putting the thing about the skeptic strikes back. And so um, I want to spend just a couple of minutes uh, 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 doing that. And the other thing is that um, uh, in office hours, uh, someone raised a question about, uh, that um, I thought put things in a very helpful way. It hadn't occurred to me to put them in that way. So I want to just work over this way. I mean, someone in office hours said to me, um, So someone said to me, look, what's so puzzling about this class is knowing what's inside the mind and what's outside the mind. So you start out thinking, well, here you have your mind with all its thoughts. Um, out there is the world with all the objects causing things to happen inside your mind. And then you think, well, uh, okay, uh, th th that seems like the sensible picture. So what's in your mind includes all the thoughts you're having. Yeah, that's all right, too. And then the stuff out there is causing you to have those thoughts. And then you think, well, I have a causal theory of reference. So that means that which objects I'm thinking about so is part of my thoughts. It's which objects are causing my thoughts that makes them the thoughts they are. Right? They wouldn't be the same thoughts if it was different objects. The objects have really become constituents of the thoughts. Follow me very closely here. This is, <laughs> I think this is probably a way to put the most confusing thing about the single... Mo Tell me if I'm right about this. <laughs> there might be lots more confusing things. But then you think, well, so that's not really the right picture here. The, um, what happens is that the thoughts encompass the causal chain from object to term. So the objects are really there as constituents of your thoughts. The objects are literally in your mind. Um, and that's where these puzzles about how you have knowledge of your own mind, how you know whether you're thinking, um, these come up once you have this kind of picture. Yeah. So what's happened is that you start out thinking of the mind as confined to the head. The mind is over here. And then you realize that once you've got a causal account of representation, the mind is stretching out to encompass um, various aspects of the world. So you start out thinking, my mind is, your mind is over here with your brain, right? But then you think, no, I'm looking at that projector, say. And so my mind reaches out to and encompasses the projector. The projector is a constituent of my mind. Yes? And because you're fallible about whether the projector's there, or you might make a mistake about whether it's the same projector twice, um, uh, you get that kind of uncertainty about the contents of your own mind. Now, um, putting it like this might make it sound like idealism, uh, because it makes it sound like the objects that you started out thinking of as regular tables and chairs, concrete objects, independent of you, they're actually just constituents of your mind. But that's not the picture. It's rather that, look, as you can see, if you take the mind away, the objects are still there. Right? As I, I demonstrated that, right? Um, so <laughs> the objects aren't sensations or something like that. The objects are just the regular concrete tables and chairs and so on. So you start out thinking um, the objects are out there external to my mind causing thoughts. And then you think, well, what is it for a thought to be the thought it is? Well, that depends on... Um, uh, which objects are causally affecting my use of terms. Um, and so my mind, n now when you look at a star, when you are thinking about Sirius B, your mind has stretched 
all the way to Sirius B, has looped in and is encompassing it. So one thing that is so puzzling about the, uh, the class so far, I think, is, is, partly, is partly just that picture that um, the world has uh, stretched out to encompass objects where your natural picture is, well, it's just confined to your head. But of course, I talk about the spatial boundaries of the mind. It doesn't make much sense anyhow. But if you, but if you do think in terms of the spatial boundaries of the mind, you have to think of it as stretching out to encompass the environment, uh, which is not to say the environment's um, dependent on your mind. As I say, it was someone in office hours who raised this question, and um, I think part of what's still puzzling, if you've got this picture, if you get to this picture, is, look, the, what's going on is that there's this stuff in your mind, and then the object causes stuff, the external object causes stuff to happen in your mind. And now the external object is a constituent of your mind. How did that happen? Just having a causal connect, you've got something in your mind over here. Something causes you something in your mind. And that so actually gets into your mind. But that seems a bit, a bit sudden. <laughs> <laughs> a bit intimate, <laughs> just, just, just an account of a causal connection. You see what I mean? Um, uh, and I think something like that is... is that, uh, so let me just ask you, um, well, when this was raised, I thought that, that actually is probably what is confusing about where we have got to. Um, that the question, how can something just being causally connected to what's inside your mind, a term or an image or something, how can that be enough to bring the object itself inside your mind? It might be a bit too early for this, but um, uh, can I just ask, does that have resonance for any of you? Does that catch something that you find puzzling about the class? Yes. <laughs> Sorry? Yes, right. Right. Then it is, there's a change. That's right. And then there it is. That's the change in your mind. Not inside your mind, because you feel a change in it. Right. But th th that's the thing. That is, that is the, I think that is the natural picture. There's something out there that causes a change in your mind. Right? But the thing is, you couldn't have the thoughts you're having unless those objects were causing you to have. Those uh, to use the terms or have the images that you are having, yep. They wouldn't. You wouldn't be having the same thoughts if it wasn't the same objects, the same water, the same people, the same girdle, or whatever it is. Yeah, you couldn't be having those thoughts without the objects. So the objects themselves are part of what's making your mind have the psychological states in it that it does. Yeah. So that your mind actually depends on the existence of the objects. That's where these dramatic conclusions like we d you don't know whether you're thinking or you don't know whether you're having the same thought again. That's what makes these dramatic conclusions possible. Yeah. And the puzzling, so I think that's in itself a little bit to take on board. But I think the key thing that's puzzling is just how can something merely being causally connected to what's in your mind bring that thing into your mind. So there isn't an answer at the back of the book for this. I, I, GSI, do, is, is there a... <laughs> um, I think this is where current discussion of these topics really is. I, I mean, something like this is... So if you're finding it puzzling, that's fine. Um, there are literally thousands of philosophers at the moment who find this puzzling. Yeah, uh, 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 Because the arguments that lead us to this position seem individually very compelling. Yeah. But it is a, a difficult uh, uh, situation to understand. And what I was saying, um, what I was suggesting last time is that suppose you think um, not just of causation, but of consciousness. Suppose you think not just of the object acting on you, but you experiencing the object. So to be seeing the table, um, the table has to be causally acting on you all right. But your experience of, uh, say, the color purple, the, um, there's more to it than just the causation. Uh, or at any rate, it's a very special kind of causation. And if you think of thought as depending 
not just on a causal link, but on your experience of the object. Well, the experience of the object, seem, th if you think of it as a relation, you can, th that helps, it seems to me, to see how experience could be something that really does bring the object inside your mind for you to think about it. But if you're puzzled about this, that's fine. This is genuinely puzzling, if you see what I mean. It's not that you're not understanding. It's that it really is difficult. But it's hard for me to, it's probably hard for you too, to make the distinction between finding it puzzling because it in itself is puzzling and finding it puzzling because you haven't really understood what's going on. Um, <laughs> yes, no, no. I'm sorry, can you do that louder? Yeah, so I mean, I'll admit to be someone who tries to find it, like, the sheer being inside my mind is very hard to understand. You find it hard to understand? Yeah, sunburn. Yeah, it's not... Right. Right. Yes. Right. The sun's not there in the burn, but it wouldn't be sunburn unless the sun had caused it. Yeah. You could say that. The thing is, with sunburn, you have this distinction between the way the thing is intrinsically. You know, you can see this uh, pattern of burn on your skin and just think, well, I'm not sure of that sunburn or not. Yep. Um, so there's something, there's the intrinsic, what's happened intrinsically to all the cells. Yeah. And then there's a cause. And you can know about the nature of the, the damage to your skin without knowing its cause. Yeah. The thing about your thoughts is, um, you know, if you think of your thoughts as like uh, sunburn, yeah? So whether it's a thought about Gödel, well, you know what it is intrinsically, right? You look inside your mind, you think, well, I'm having a thought here, and if the sunburn analogy is correct, you'd be looking at this damage, the analog of your da this damage to your skin, yeah? So you say, well, I look at the damage to my skin, and I say, well, there's damage to my skin, all right. I wonder if it's sunburn. I wonder if the sun caused that. So you look inside your mind, and you see a thought. And you say, I've got, I've got a thought here. Um, I wonder who it's about. Maybe it's about Gödel. You, you, you see what I mean? The, 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 the trouble is to see what the analog is of the intrinsic damage to the skin. Because when you look at your thoughts, well, you just seem to get the whole thing. You, you, you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, if you get anything. You could be mistaken about whether you're having a thought. Yes, that's right. You could be, you could be, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not, I think I'm not hearing quite right. You, you, you could be disturbed, you could be puzzled about whether it's actually a thought about Gödel or someone else. Maybe that's not the way to put it. I mean, the way to put it is just that you could be mistaken about whether it's sort of a genuine thought about Gödel at all or about, um, versus whether it's just sort of, you know, a thought of the life and doesn't really refer to anything at all. Yeah, I actually had this at a party the other night. I, I was talking to someone and after a bit I had to say to him, you're not thinking of me. You're thinking of Simon. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You think you're thinking about one person, but actually you think it. That can happen, but it's, it's kind of a special case. And it's not really the analog of sunburn is the thing. There's not something, it's hard to know what the invariant thing is, like the intrinsic nature of the sunburn. Yeah? Well, I guess I was thinking about, like, you know, the brain in the back. And what the brain right. That's true. That's true. Yeah. 
Okay. I I I I I I I see the I, I see the idea. Yeah. Any, anything else? This was trying to catch what I thought you guys might be finding puzzling. So, actually, just can you put your hand up if you, if that catches something you found puzzling? I'd really be curious. Three. Okay. <laughs> can you put your hand up if that seems fairly straightforward? What I just said. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Five. <laughs> can you put your hand up if you, none of this stuff ever occurred to you? But it is extremely puzzling. <laughs> okay, six. Okay, there's a large volume of abstentions here. Um, <laughs> okay, you can plead the Fifth Amendment. But <laughs> okay. Okay. So let me tell you the way I thought of putting the the revenge of the skeptic last time, um, which was um, a normal. Uh, uh, if the world is the way we think it is, then um, there's the underlying physical reality. And the medium-sized world is kind of sitting on top of that in some way. Uh, it, 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 it's all that, uh, that medium-sized world out there is generated by the underlying physics. And then we come along and we encounter this medium-sized world in experience. Um, and the puzzle of the brain in the vat is it could be, as we think it is, that there's a physical reality out there that supports a medium-sized world, um, and that's what's generating our thoughts, and we're thinking about that medium-sized reality. Or it could be, um, as it is in the brain in a vat scenario, where there's the physics of the vat-tending machinery, but in a way that's really a basic physics, is not actually supporting anything like the medium-sized world that we ordinarily think in terms of. So in both cases, we've got a causal story here, um, in, both in one case, uh, that causal story is enabling us to think about a medium-sized world and we know what it's like. In the other case, the thoughts are simply enabling you to think about an alien world where you have no conception of what it's like. And the skeptic's point is, you can't tell just by inner reflection, as Dylan just said, you can't tell just by inner reflection which scenario you're in. So that's the skeptic striking back. At the time, I thought this was a much better way of putting it than I had last week, but um, perhaps not. Um, so the picture I'm suggesting, I mean, um, I think this helps with the puzzles here, just to try and draw this together, is to say that your thoughts depend on experience of that medium-sized reality. That experience tells you what the world out there is like. Um, if you're in the good case, then all that medium-sized stuff out there is causing you to have the thoughts that you do. All that's happening inside your mind. Um, the skeptic's point is, uh, you might be wrong. You, might, you could make a mistake about what kind of world you're in. But it's, exper it's the experience of the stuff out there that brings the medium-sized world into your mind. So that's how I think we can sort it out. But um, uh, this is a very confusing set of issues, and each must find his own path. Um, okay. <laughs> I seem to be ending every topic in a kind of whirl of confusion, but um, let's, let's, let's move on. Okay? Uh, uh, unless there are any questions or not. Okay. Um, Dretschke's idea is that we can amp up the causal theory a bit by... Um, thinking about uh, as models of most primitive kinds of representation, the kind of representation that you find in meters and gauges. Um, these aren't usually taken, these aren't what would first occur to you as models for the most primitive kinds of representation. They seem a little bit fancy. Um, you know, they seem like complex products that we, we generate rather than the most primitive kinds of representation. Um, but Dretschke has a wonderful idea as to um, how you might use them as a model for all representation. So remember what the general problem was that we started the class with? The problem was, how do we say what a language is? How do, how do we characterize what's distinctive of language? And I said, well, it's something that has sentences in it, th sentences that are capable of being true or false. And so you've got uh, sentences made up out of bits and pieces that can be recombined with each other in lots of different ways, but always so as to generate things that are capable of truth or falsity. 
And the meaning of a statement is the way the world has to be for that statement to be true. Now, the thing about that is, the puzzling thing about that is, most of the physical world isn't governed by standards of correctness. Out there in the physical world, you have the movements of the planets, you have um, uh, electrons uh, whirling around atom, in atoms, um, you have the world governed by all these laws, you have lots of causation in the physical world, independent of the mind. Um, Mercury can be pulled from its orbit um, by other planets. But if Mercury pulls away from its planets, nobody says, oh, look, Mercury made a mistake. There goes Mercury again, wobbling off its path. Right? And you've got a system of causal relations here, but you don't have right and wrong. So what is happening with humans is that we ourselves are just made up of lots of atoms. Um, governed by general laws. Um, there's lots of causation here. We are causally affected by each other, by the, by the external objects around us and so on. But no amount of simply being causally affected by um, other things, it's of itself generates standards of right and wrong. So that's a really fundamental problem for the causal theory. The causal theory just says Look, here's a whole stack of causal connections that humans stand into. You've got causation that's the, you, you, the dominant source, or um, you're differentially sensitive to the various characteristics of the object, all, all these different aspects of causation that we talked about. But how can any amount of that stuff stack up to us getting things right or wrong? And once you take it for granted that we do have a language, then you can understand how to set up standards of right and wrong. Once you have a, st a language, you can set up laws, you can set up the rules of games, um, you can set up parking regulations. You can, it's very easy once you've got a language to set up further regulations determining what's going to count as right or wrong. But how does it happen in the first place that you get your primitive language um, in which there are standards of right and wrong? The causal theory says, well, it's causation that's doing it but how can it be causation that's doing it? Most of the physical world is governed by causation without having standards of right and wrong. So if you take it for granted that you're capable of thinking, then um, you can do that. You, you, you could say, well, language depends on thinking. But then the basic question is, how are there standards of right and wrong for thinking? And I, said, I, th I think I said ages ago, um, Anybody's first thought when they think about how language works is, well, it's human psychology that makes it work. It's, us, it's our minds that breathe life into language. But the trouble with that is, then you just push all the questions back into, how is it that we are capable of thinking in the first place? Thinking itself involves having standards of right and wrong apply to you. And how does it come about that you have stand that your thought is governed by standards of right and wrong? Not because of some conventional system that you laid down, but that just presupposes you're already capable of thinking. Um, so uh, anyway, you might say, um, uh, think ordinary thinking, certainly any kind of uh, complex human thinking, usually presupposes an understanding of, of right and wrong. And anyhow, the question, how could there be standards of right and wrong for thinking? is just as puzzling as the question about language. So the general problem is, how can we explain the original source of the standards of rightness and wrongness for representation? And that's the, uh, how does it come about, that's Dretschke's title, how does it come about that there's such a thing as misrepresentation? And we haven't really properly addressed that yet. Uh, all, all these weeks in, we have not squarely addressed this. Yeah, I mean, I hope that everything we've said so far has seemed plausible and occasionally illuminating, but um, it hasn't actually been a head-on attack on this. Okay? Okay, so Dretschke's first pass idea is, let's think about these gauges and meters and so on. He says, there's a kind of meaning that attaches to systems or components of systems for which there are identifiable functions. If you know what it's for, if you know what its point is, 
then you can talk about standards of rightness and wrong. Because if it's meant to be doing something, you can say if it's doing that thing correctly or not. The position of a fuel gauge represents how much fuel there is in the tank. So you can talk about a fuel gauge as representing. If the needle's over to the right, that means that the tank is full. Yes? That's all right? So you've got representation there. So how does that happen? How does that work? Uh, what, how did it come about that after all, you've just got a dumb petrol gauge here? How did that get to be? I mean, if it's puzzling how you or I got to represent, then how did the petrol gauge manage to do it? It is but a humble petrol gauge, right? What's going on? How, how come it's managing to represent? And here's Dretzky's definition. D's being G means functionally that W is F. The needles being over to the right means that the petrol tank is full. Yeah. If uh, the needles function is to indicate the petrol tank's condition, and it does this in part by indicating the W that the petrol tank is full by being over to the right. So there are two key notions there, function and indicate. And, and indicate is the causal bit. Indicate uh, is the bit where it is, is what, uh, indicate, um, <laughs> indicate, indicate um, is uh, the needle being over to the right is caused by the tank being full. If the needle is over to the right, that will typically be caused by the tank being full. Okay? So indicate is the causal notion. Indicate is what Dretschke is, in quite a light way, basically taking over the whole causal theory. Yep. Does that make sense? That notion of indication is where the causation comes in. Um, let me put it like this. If, if you say smoke indicates fire, the smoke indicate the presence of fire? Yes, of course it does. Yeah, why? Because the smoke typically causes the smoke. Hello? <laughs> Take it from me. The fire typically causes smoke, right? So if you see a whole bunch of smoke, you know there's a fire somewhere there. Yes? So you can take the smoke as a sign of fire. Smoke indicates fire in that sense. Yeah? If you go to the doctor and you say, oh, look at these spots, I'm covered in these spots, what's going on? And the doctor says, that means you've got measles. Right? The spots mean measles. Yes? In that they indicate the presence of measles. They are reliably caused by measles. measles. Yes? So indicate there is a causal notion. You could say that, um, I don't know, maybe, uh, um, maybe whenever Bill walks past, I say, Bill, I'm really good at detecting the presence of Bill. So you could take a cry of, hi, Bill, from me as indicating the presence of Bill. Yes? Okay. Um, so if I tell you, if you ask me what time it is, and I say, well, it's 10 past 3 or whatever, then you could take my speech as indicating what time it is, because the fact, it was the fact that it is that time that caused me to say that. Right? So that's indicating. So indicating is a causal notion. Yep. Um, the needle indicates that the tank is full by being over to the right. Um, and uh, Dretschke's definition is R indicates C um, means if there's an R, then C. And uh, that will typically be because C's are what cause R's. Yeah, so you're going from the effect to the cause. If you get the effect, then you get the cause. How about that? That's all right for indicates? If I'm telling you all about Napoleon, then my remarks are indicators in that sense of how things are with Napoleon. Because I'm really good at this. Um, every time I do this class, I have to read up about Napoleon. It, yeah, so it's what Napoleon did that is causing my speech. Yeah? The biter? The writer. The writer. Napoleon. 
Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> I meant Napoleon. I, I, I meant the, um, what was it, the, uh, the French emperor. Yep. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Okay. So the function of the fuel gauge is to indicate how much fuel is in the tank. And we assign that function to the gauge, right? That's up to us. We decide what the gauge is. I mean, you could have decided that you want to measure how high the fuel is in the tank. That might be important. But, um, and it might have the very same design uh, if it was just, e even though it was, his task was now to monitor the height of petrol. But what we want it for is to um, determine how much fuel is in the tank. Okay, so that's all right for function. It's, it's up to us when we make a measuring instrument to decide what function it's going to have. Yeah? So if you ask what's the, if you're looking at a whole batch of gauges and you're saying, what's the point of all that? Then um, what you need to know is how they were designed, what the person was thinking who designed them, why they're in the car in the first place. So here's a definition of meaning. D's being G, the, petrol, the, the needles being over to the right means that the tank is full, uh, is the same as the needles function as uh, um, imposed on it by the designer. The needles function is to indicate the condition of the um, petrol of, of the, uh, petrol tank and it performs this function in part by indicating that the petrol tank is full by being over to the right. Yeah, so it's fa the reason you built it is that it's a good indicator of uh, the condition of the petrol tank. That's why you built the petrol gauge. Um, and uh, uh, then it just represents those states that it is its function to indicate. We all on board with that? Um, now, the only trouble with this is that if the only functions we can find here are assigned functions, and everything depends here on the intentions of the designer of the gauge, um, if the only, uh, this is Dretschke, if the only functions are assigned functions, then this talk about functional meaning is tainted with the purposes, intentions, and beliefs of those who assign the function from which meaning in derives is misrepresentational powers. So we haven't really got to the, ba that, that's Dretschke, that's a quote from Dretschke. So we haven't really got to the basic problem here, yeah? Because we're appealing, we're taking for granted the purposes, intentions, and beliefs um, of, uh, of the designer. This is Dretschke. We shall not have tracked meaning insofar as this involves the power of misrepresentation to its original source, we shall merely have worked our way back somewhat indirectly to our own mysterious capacity for representation. Yeah. So you see the problem? Yep, sure. Uh, just getting it wrong. The needle indicates that the tank is uh, full, but it's not full. Yeah, you, have a, you, you can have a faulty gauge. Yeah, you can have a faulty gauge. Yeah, or it just gets stuck a little bit. Um, you know, that can happen. The tank is wrong. The, your gauge is wrong, that's right. Yeah, it gave me a wrong reading. Yeah, uh, that's what you'd say. Yeah. Uh, and so we are explaining a notion of representation here and misrepresentation, but um, it's not fundamental. Yeah. It's cl that's clear? It's, it's clear why it, it's an interesting idea, but it's not really getting at the basic problem. And the basic problem was explain where it comes from in the first place, the original source of the standards of right and wrong for representations. Okay? I mean, if God had made us all merely as gauges, then it might work. Uh, we'd still have the problem of explaining how God can think, but um, assuming that that's not, <laughs> assuming that we wouldn't get away with that, it's not going to work, this. Okay, but yes? I, I'm sorry, it's quite noisy. Can you? Uh, 
how, how it doesn't solve the original issue. Okay, the original issue is how come we have thoughts and uh, speech for which there are standards of right and wrong in the first place? Um, and this talk about uh, functions, I mean, it's really critical here that you know what the function is of the petrol gauge, because otherwise you could be saying, if you just have indicate, then the gauge is indicating lots of things. It indicates the height of the petrol in the tank. It indicates the volume of petrol in the tank. And it, it, yeah, yeah. Um, so we need to know what the functions are. It's with the function that you get right and wrong. Um, uh, but then you ask, well, what's the function? Well, the function has to do with the purposes, intentions, and beliefs of the person who made the gauge and the people who use the gauge. Um, and we still haven't explained how it is that those thoughts, the thoughts involved in those purposes, intentions, and beliefs, how it is that there are standards of rightness and wrongness for them. I mean, do they have a function? Well, that would just mean that, as I said by the God thing, that um, there, the, 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 there were some other set of purposes, uh, intentions, and beliefs lying behind that. Yeah, we've got to stop somewhere and say, how does, where does the standards of rightness and wrongness come from in the first place? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Dretschke's idea now is let's keep that definition of functional meaning, but let's look at some really primitive cases um, of representation. He gives the example of our old friend the magnetosome. Um, marine bacteria, as, as is pretty generally known, um, need oxygen-free water to survive, right? If you're a marine bacterium, if you were a marine bacterium, um, your main goal, your first goal in life would be to find oxygen-free water. Yes? Take it from me. Uh, <laughs> don't say you don't learn anything in this class. Um, now, they have, in, these marine bacteria have internal gadgets that allow them to find oxygen-free water. They are little magnets that allow them to move towards magnetic north. Magnetic north is where the deeper, is where the deeper oxygen-free water is. Right, the water at the top is all getting roused around and oxygen bubbled into it. Um, so it, moving towards magnetic north into the deeper water is what you want to do if you're a marine bacterium. So um, here, is, um, here is the kind of thing. Um, this is a magnetosome, and the red bit there, is, uh, uh, sorry, there's the, the whole thing is the bacterium, and um, the red thing there is the magnetosome, right? So that points you towards magnetic north. Um, okay, so the function, what's the function of, that mag uh, of the magnetosome? It does have a function. I mean, any zoologist looking at this thing is going to say, what's that for? Yes? Just as you say about the organs of the body, if you ask about the heart, you can ask, what's that for? Yeah. So there's a notion of function here that doesn't have to do with intention and purpose. When Harvey said the function of the heart is to pump blood, he's not saying that's why, uh, uh, he's not saying that's why I made it. You see what I mean? It's not like a petrol gauge, but it does have a function. With a magnetosome, and this thing does have a function, but in a different basis than the petrol gauges and so on have a function. The function is to indicate the presence of, of water. So um, given that that magnetosome has a function, however that happened, um, we can say uh, that the function is to indicate the direction of oxygen-free water, and then we can just take over Gretzky's definition here. Um, the magnetosomes um, are pointing uh, to uh, 3 o'clock means that the oxygen-free water is at 3 o'clock. Yeah, it's just like the petrol gauge. means that the oxygen-free water is at 3 o'clock. And, and that, uh, that just has the same definition. The magnetosome's function is to indicate um, where the, the location of the oxygen-free water, and it does this in part by indicating that the oxygen-free water is at 3 o'clock by itself pointing to 3 o'clock. You see what I mean? Okay. So since there's this more primitive notion of function that we use in biology the whole time, you can just take over the definition of meaning 
that we were using for the petrol gauges. And that notion of function isn't explained in terms of purposes, beliefs, and intentions. This notion of function is explained in terms of the role of the system in meeting the biological needs of the organism. When someone says the function of the heart is to pump blood, what they mean is this is what good it does you having a heart. This is what it does in the biological system. This is its place in keeping the biological system going. This is why you need a heart to keep the blood pumping. That's what, why it would damage you not to have a heart. Yep. That's right. It does it, 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 so first of all, this doesn't presuppose anything about intentions or plans or purposes, right? Because um, it is but a humble bacterium, right? Um, it doesn't have intentions and plans and purposes, yeah? Um, um, but it does have needs. Yeah. So this is really anchored to needs, the biological needs of the organism. But that's all right. Talking about biology, I mean, unless you're, um, how should I say, seriously theistic, um, the talk about needs here doesn't really have anything specially to do with anyone's needs or purposes. Sorry, with anyone's, with anyone's beliefs or purposes. Yeah? It is a teleological explanation, that's right. Biology is full of teleological explanations. I mean, the thing wouldn't have evolved unless it uh, pointed you to the oxygen-free water. Its point is to point you to the oxygen-free water. That doesn't count as a purpose. That's right. It, there are lots. Uh, uh, okay, so l l there are lots of complex questions in this area that we are going to come to. Yeah, um, but um, um, the basic idea is that uh, when we talk about functions here, we are talking about needs. And you can understand needs. Well, you can understand needs just in terms of um, what keeps the thing alive. And what keeps the thing alive is not a matter of anyone's purposes. Yeah, that's just a basic fact about it. Yeah. And you can say what the, the function of this is what it brings to keeping the thing alive. Yeah. I mean, I should say there is an American use of need that is... Um, not really quite the notion we have here. I, 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 was, I, I, I first noticed this when I was in a bar, I'm sorry to say, and someone said to me, do you need nuts with that? Um, <laughs> that's not the notion of need we have here, uh, right? The notion of need we have here has to do with um, the sur survival, yeah? Uh, uh, the needs of an organism and drink, water, and so on, uh, uh, food. Does it need to be alive? That's right, it's a bad functioning heart, yeah. yeah. The, 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 these are important questions, right? But let, let me just give you the, the official answer to, to this, um, which is that, uh, that to, the, the talk about needs and functions here, um, it is, if you're just trying to understand, well, first of all, it has to do with why the thing is there in the first place. If you believe that things evolved, yeah, on the evolutionary hypothesis, yeah, then um, the, the, the question is, what's the explanation of the existence of the magnetosome? And the explanation of the existence of the magnetosome is that it does this thing for the organism that allows the, uh, uh, the gene pool to proliferate, something like that. Um, so it has to do with why it's there in the first place. So if you say, does it need to do that? Well, um, its function is to do that. And you explain what its function is because the reason, it's, the reason it exists in the first place is that it is serving this need of the organism. Yeah. And a need of the organism is itself a, bi a biological notion, some, something without which the organism wouldn't flourish. I mean, if you're looking, if you're going to keep chickens, 
Yeah, a friend of mine just started keeping chickens, so this is fresh in my head. Um, that um, uh, then you need to get some kind of instruction on what chickens need, right? And that is not, um, that is just a matter of, how should I say, basic animal husbandry. Yeah, I mean, if someone said, but do the chickens need to be alive? Well, <laughs> yes, I mean, right. That, 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 is, that is what the needs of the chickens are, right? They're what they need to keep them alive and healthy. Yeah. And these are just facts, biological facts. So what we're doing here is we are rooting meaning in this kind of biological fact. Yep, yeah. Right. Like, if there's very little bird seed, we know the chicken is not fed. Right. But then it seems like we're kind of pushing a connection between these two things. Right. The system, right? The seed isn't there so that it can feed the chicken. If the seed is just there, it just so happens to be nourishing the chicken. Okay, that, that's a nice example. Um, so uh, the level of the seed in the cage will indicate the, the, um, the uh, health of the bird the well-fedness of the bird, right? Um, uh, so you've got indication there, yes? But intuitively, you don't have representation. It doesn't represent the condition of the bird, yeah? And in this analysis, the reason is that it's not the function of the bird seed to indicate the, um, the well-fedness of the bird. The level, uh, yeah, there's a difference here between the, the way the magnetosome is functioning. The, the magnetosome is functioning to um, direct the behavior of the bacterium. It makes the bacterium go one way rather than the other. Yeah. The level of the bird seed is not functioning as an indicator of the well-fedness of the chicken in the sense that it's something I use to then do something else. It's not something that's going to direct my activity by tipping me off as to um, what the condition of the bird is. And actually, just as I speak, it occurs to me the causal connection is round the wrong way here anyhow. Uh, because it's the level of the bird seed is causing. No, wait a minute. Um, <laughs> actually, I, I wish to cancel what I was just about to say, because um, it does indicate, in Dretzka's sense, um, uh, where's the definition? It does indicate, in Dretzka's sense, um, if the bird seed is high, then it's well fed. So you, 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 it does meet that definition of indication. Okay, but it's not, um, it's not representation, because that's not its function. It's not there because it indicates the level of well-fedness. Okay, so that's right. For representation, you need both indication and that the function is to indicate. Yeah. There was someone else. In the, uh, uh, okay. So here we're explaining function in a way that doesn't presuppose anything about intentions or plans or purposes. So the upshot here is, if the experimenter takes a magnet um, to the top of the water, um, indicating to the hapless bacterium that the oxygen-free water is upwards, yeah, then the hapless bacteria with the experimenter holding the magnet over the top will be lured to their deaths and the experimenter there then is in a position to say, fooled you, you misrepresented, you thought the oxygen free water was up at the top and you got it wrong. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> okay, but now we've explained how there can be misrepresentation. Yeah, we've got right and wrong from the causal connection plus the idea of function. And now the question is, can we just take that and run that through everything? Human thought, human language, the whole lot. On that note, <laughs> we'll pick up with that on uh, um, Monday. Okay. Good, thanks.